And we've heard from many Hoosiers across the state of Indiana, and I certainly um, and personally understand that uh, there is no more spiritually important week for many believers than the week that we currently find ourselves in. I'm um, personally comforted by the fact uh, that in Matthew 18, 20, it says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I. And of course, that's a pretty powerful reminder um, that it's two or three, not 200 or 300 or 2,000 or 3,000. It's emphasizing, of course, that it is the church body, uh, not the building, no matter how architecturally awesome or beautiful that that structure may be, but it's the, it's the actual body and the church's body's relationship with the um, higher above that is most important. In the faith of my Jewish friends, of course, Passover started yesterday. Um, today for Christians, uh, another important day. Of course, today is the day that um, Jesus put a towel around his waist and he, and, and he washed uh, the feet of his disciples. And I would just uh, submit to everyone that it's time to wash some feet without touching them. Uh, it's, it's time for our families and our neighbors to stay safe. It's time to serve them in this way through distancing. It's time to serve them by checking in on them. It's time to serve them by providing food and by providing protection for those who are in need. And it's time to serve them by respecting life, by not potentially transferring a virus. My faith teaches me, in fact, it, it's a command of Jesus that we are to love God and we are to love others. And during this week, for those who celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus, we're reminded that there is no greater um, love or sacrifice at this time than to do what we can to keep others safe. And staying inside, I know, uh, is a sacrifice, but it's also a tremendous demonstration of love. And yes, we know that among these Three, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of them all is love. And so on this weekend, it is my hope um, that we choose to worship, those who do choose to worship, um, do so in an act of love with respect um, to others, for your family and for our extended um, Hoosier family. If that's at home, um, live streaming a sermon, I'm loving it. If that's um, taking communion on your sofa, I'm loving it. If that's kneeling um, in front of a television is how uh, unique that experience may be, uh, I'm loving it. If that's driving to a church parking lot or out to an empty tentless um, field, you must stay inside of your vehicle. This is not uh, a tailgate. This, there's no, going to be no physical interaction um, as strange and or, or as unusual as it may be with clergy uh, or staff or other participants in that worship service. Your vehicles um, must contain only those from your household. Your cars need to be spaced out uh, about by nine feet or more. It's preferred um, that no communion be handed out, but if so, it has to be prepackaged and it has to meet the current um, food safety Standards. So I would just say um, to everyone on this, the coming days, get the word and then get home. My only desire, our only desire, uh, is for your uh, family, for your congregation, the very definition of the word congregation, um, is for you to be as safe and as strong and as healthy um, next week as you are this week. And so with that, uh, it is time for Indiana's daily doctor's appointment, I guess you could say, uh, about 2.30 every day, and we'll hear from Dr. Box at the Department of Health. Thank you, Governor. I have to say that's a tough act to follow, and I think there's no more important message that you'll get today than what the gov governor just said. So. I am going to start out, unfortunately, with some sobering facts. Um, as you can see on the slide here today, we've had 42 new deaths reported in the last 24 hours. 
I want to continue to remind you that some of those deaths actually reached back as far as mid-March. About three-fourths, or 75% of them, are deaths that have occurred since Sunday. So most of it's more recent reporting, but some of them do go a ways back. And that is why yesterday, in an order I put out, that you had to report these deaths to me and positive COVID-19. And that will take effect tomorrow. Also, the next slide here shows you our reported deaths as broken down um, by our counties across the state of Indiana. These are incredibly sobering numbers, and they're a stark reminder that we have not reached the peak of this pandemic in this state at this time. So what the governor said about social distancing is still incredibly important. And the most important thing I would say after whatever worship service you do, it's not the family dinner with 25 or 30 people there. Even the CDC sent out stories about families that had lost three individuals because of meeting just for a birthday party or a funeral. So please take that to heart. Please don't expose any of your elderly individuals in your family to that potential risk. While the number of tests reported to us today is lower than what we've been seeing lately, I want to caution Hoosiers that that does not mean that we're out of the woods. This means really there was a lag time in some reports of labs that were reported to us and they'll be on uh, the actual report tomorrow. That volume fluctuates daily depending on when they arrive at the State Department of Health and we always catch up the next day on the dashboard. No one should draw any conclusions based on the number of Hoosiers that are tested. Instead, look at the continued high activity that we have through central Indiana and increasing cases in Lake County, St. Joseph County, Allen County, and Decatur counties. We are nowhere near being through our surge, so we need to continue to stay home and keep talking about the precautions amongst ourselves and with our neighbors that we know you should be taking. To illustrate this point, yesterday our strike team collected more than 500 specimens to be tested. In addition, we held our first drive through clinic in Lake County at Maryville High School and tested in the first day 225 healthcare workers, first responders, and essential workers, which is far beyond our expectations for that first day. We'll be back in Maryville today, and we will continue to be there through uh, uh, next Monday and probably Tuesday. We're continuing to work on other locations and want to remind everyone that these clinics are for people who are healthcare workers, first responders, essential workers, and who have symptoms of COVID-19. A couple of other quick updates. Yesterday I issued an order, as I've already mentioned, requiring that all labs testing Indiana for COVID-19 report all of their negatives in addition to their positive reports within 24 hours. This order takes effect tomorrow and we'll be sending out more guidance today explaining how you can do this. The purpose is to ensure that we have an accurate baseline to better calculate what percentage of tests are coming back positive in our state. The order also requires that all long-term care facilities, jails, prisons, or other congregate housing facilities report their COVID-19 cases. Also, if their uh, individual employees become ill, and certainly any COVID-19 suspected death or COVID-19 death needs to re be reported. And that way, in that congregate setting, ISDH will know we need to be reaching out and finding out what we can do to help you. It's vital that hospitals or local health departments notify the Indiana State Department of Health immediately when a death occurs because it informs our actions. This requirement will help in that reporting. I also need to address conf continued confusion about personal protective equipment. The State Health Department has a very limited supply of personal protective equipment, most of which has been donated by individuals all across the state. We have distributed everything we received from the Strategic National Stockpile to date, and we, to date, have been able to meet all the needs of any individual long-term care facility, any individual EMS or hospital that has reached out to us. But it is very important that we continue to conserve this and that you continue to understand that we don't have a huge stockpile right here in the state of Indiana to be giving out. I'm incredibly grateful for the assistance we've received from the Colts and from par private partners from across the state who have donated these supplies. We are pushing those out where they're needed as quickly as possible. We're not able to order supplies for hospitals or long-term care facilities. We can supplement their supplies. So we've had a couple of long-term care facilities and residential facilities say, oh, well, I, we don't need to order anymore because the state has this. No, I need you to continue to work your supply chain and continue to get what you can, and then we'll supplement as needed. 
Finally, I want to remind people about the importance of social distancing. This is an important week, as the governor just mentioned, for religious observances, observances for people across our state. Those observances need to be different than they have been for, before. The governor's executive order limits the size of gatherings to more than, no more than 10 people. If you do feel the need to go into a field or go into a parking lot, I would say communion should be brought from your own home. Bring your own crackers, your own juice or sparkling wine, whatever, and take that in remembrance of our Lord. Please don't pass out things. That's where I'm concerned that people could get infected. But if you do that, stay in your cars. Go to the bathroom before you leave and don't get out of your cars for anything except when you reach home again. I wish everyone a very blessed weekend and I hope that everyone stays healthy and safe. Thank you, Dr. Box. Um, Fred. Thank you, Governor. So we all know during the month of March, uh, the weekly unemployment claims numbers pretty much shattered uh, everything that we'd seen before. For the week ending uh, Mar uh, April 4th, uh, we didn't see much different. We tracked about 133,639 unemployment claims uh, that were filed for that week. This is down a little bit from the previous week, but it still posts the second highest number of weekly claims filed in Indiana history. Although we're seeing a high number of claims being filed in Indiana, we're also tracking an extremely large number of claims being paid. So already for the month of April, we've paid out 175,195 payments just up to this date in the month of April. Compare that to April 2019. For the, for the entire month, we paid 71,000 uh, uh, pay, payments. We continue to have high call volume that's associated with our high claims volume. We are having some technical difficulties that we're working on this week. We started with a new contractor and we're working out all of the kinks in that. But we have had some complaints or some concerns about calls being transferred and when they're transferred, uh, they end up uh, getting dropped. We're working with our IT team to make sure that that issue is being addressed. We've also seen a number of calls that relate to unemployment compensation benefits, specifically as it relates to pandemic unemployment compensation and pandemic unemployment assistance. So I wanna spend a few seconds uh, talking about uh, those two things uh, again. So as a reminder, the pandemic unemployment compensation is an additional $600 weekly payment uh, for claimants who are eligible for unemployment benefits. This payment will be seen um, in people's paychecks. They will start seeing them around the, week, the first week of April 20th. This payment will be retroactive to March 29th. There's nothing additional that a claimant needs to do uh, for that benefit. We will process it along with the person's normal unemployment compensation benefits. For the pandemic unemployment assistance, this is the unemployment insurance payment for an entirely new class of workers, for the independent contractors, for those who are self-employed. As a reminder, our system was not currently designed uh, to address these uh, claimants. This is an entirely new classification of workers that will be pay, paid unemployment compensation benefits. So as we build out our new system, we're looking at a variety of things and we're working across different state agencies. What we found is this, an individual who falls into one of the categories of an independent contractor or self-employed person, or even someone who uh, will otherwise uh, uh, didn't, uh, uh, didn't um, qualify for benefits, they will apply and then they end up getting denied. Well, the benefits will continue to be denied because the system does not recognize that classification of individuals just yet. We are working on that system and once that system is in place, it will recognize you uh, as a beneficiary and you will start receiving payments. That additional $600 uh, payment uh, under the pandemic unemployment compensation or assistance program will be provided to you in the same manner as well. It will be retroactive to March 29th. So 
What we found is that once an individual ends up applying for that benefit and they get denied, frustration sets in, and understandably so, because a claim was denied. Then the person will call in, and then they will probably be bombarded with maybe the calls, and then they'll have to call several times. Unfortunately, the answer will remain the same until we change our system. The denial will remain in place until there's a new system in place. And once we identify a date certain when that new system or program will be rolled out, we will let you know. We've been cascading information throughout the state on all of our employment uh, systems. We've made sure that we've uh, given the public as much information as we could. And what's been very helpful are the comments that individuals make to us, some of them leaving phone calls, uh, leaving messages, some sending emails. What we do with that information is we take it back to our shop and then we translate them into a frequently asked question and we end up providing an answer to that question. So thank you for that. So here's what we've done over the last week to make sure that we're getting the message out and we're answering questions in a more public form. We've had several webinars this week. We've had several webinars with businesses, some with employees, and we've had over 8,000 individuals register for those webinars. We also held our first Facebook Live event on yesterday, and that event reached more than 140,000 Hoosiers. Next week, we partner with Radio One, and on Tuesday at 1 p.m., Radio One is stopped is going to stop playing music across all of its bands uh, on WTLC, AM, and FM, Hot 96, and Radio Now. And they will be broadcasting some of our insurance, unemployment insurance, uh, people talking about uh, this program. So why are we doing these events? We want to provide answers to the general public about what's, about what's happening in our unemployment insurance system, about how to file claims, and some of the new benefits that are coming your way. <clears throat> We've also seen that the more information that we put out to you, the better understanding that you have about the overall system, and it reduces your necessity to call in and uh, to our lines to make sure that we are saving your time so that you don't have to wait on a call. In addition to this, we're having on April 23rd we're going to host a virtual job fair for the healthcare industry up in the Fort Wayne area. We have five major healthcare systems that will be featured. We know that there's a shortage, and we know that there's work out there yet to be done. So we want to ensure that we are providing this service to help connect Hoosiers to those needed jobs. So we're all in this together. We'll continue to provide updated information through as many outlets as possible. And just like the governor and just like Dr. Box, I wish you, uh, you know, a great holy weekend and make sure that we all play it safe. Thank you, Fred. Um, <clears throat> let me just say very quickly before we get to the questions, um, our large and small hospital network, each and every one of them have made such a difference. Uh, they've really been equation changers, quite frankly, here as they pivoted and all came together and collaborated um, in preparation and now throughout the duration of this uptick, um, unprecedented uptick in, in patient care and need. Their, their uh, collaboration and coordination has just been nothing short of incredible. And, and it should give you, it certainly does us, but it should give you uh, a heightened level of confidence and comfort that yes, we are all in this together, uh, but that we're gonna be able to provide answers and we're gonna have the proper uh, avenues to get help. And the help is there, whether it's on the economic front or whether it's on the health front or the safety front. And in, in difficult times like this, uh, I, I understand we're all concerned about a lot of things, virtually everything. Uh, it's hard to keep up maybe the energy levels, especially uh, if you're one of our healthcare workers, if you're on the front lines, if you're one of those first responders day in and day out, you're not only 
whipped uh, going home, but you're also concerned about going home if you're taking anything that you caught at work home to your own families. And I think the more and more that I um, read and talk to and, and hear from folks all over the state of Indiana, I try to share on a daily basis um, the good news. Um, the only thing that I think is more contagious than COVID-19, this coronavirus, is the um, level of Hoosier generosity and kindness. And that will be obviously underscored um, over this weekend. Um, but, it, but it is underscored every single day that we all go through this together. And I'll just very quickly read you um, one example of this from a, from a family to our healthcare workers. This one's for the team at Johnson Memorial Health um, down in Franklin, Indiana. Um, and, a, and a heartfelt letter arrived there just to express what I'm attempting to. And they said uh, their father, their, their loved one, had, had been treated there and he had um, passed away. And they wrote these words. They said to the staff at um, Johnson Memorial Health, um, it's, it's been so difficult to find the right words to express our deep gratitude and love we have for you. You took care of our dad, our father-in-law, our grandpa, Wally Slade, during his last days. From what we saw, you gave him the kind of love, care, and compassion we would have had we been able to be by his side. We love you for your kindness. Never in the many days Wally was with you did we feel like an inconvenience. You answered our many calls. You kept us informed and even put on your space suits so we could see our sweet Wally's face one last time. We love you for your communication. This disease is going to require a long and hard fight. You are strong enough to keep fighting. Families like ours are the reason you need to keep fighting. We need you. Our Wallies need you. We love you for your strength. Patience will heal and patience will pass. But please know, in the end of all this, our family, like so many others, will be forever grateful for you, regardless of of the outcome. You have a very big job to do, and we do not take your dedication and your sacrifice for granted. We love you too. We pray for your strength, health, and safety every day. Please don't give up. All our love, Brad, Emily, Katie, and Ben Slade. I just don't think it could be said better um, at any moment than the Slades did to the staff there at uh, Johnson Memorial Health. And with that, we'll turn to the line of questions. Eric Berman, WIBC. Good afternoon, Eric. There's the button. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, I want to go back to something from a couple of days ago. Uh, you said that you were frustrated by the amount of disinformation that still gets out there. What is it that's causing the most issues out there? What is the biggest misconception people have, and how do you combat that and get people to practice good practices? Yeah, I'll, Dr. Box, you want to comment on that? I mean, it's a long list for me. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll buy Dr. Box a little time. And then, Steve, you might want to talk, uh, if you would, about what you're seeing. I mean, Eric, what we, we track um, misinformation or disinformation regarding vaccines, regarding antibodies, regarding trials, regarding uh, where this is, who is uh, immune or who is not immune. Um, how you can contract this disease. It's a, it's a long list, um, and it pops up in different areas by different actors. So I'll turn to Dr. Box first, because you're coming from a very clinical perspective, and then Steve, you might talk about it more globally. That's a really good question, Eric. I, I guess what I would say is that it is a novel virus, right? It's the novel Corona SARS-CoV-2 virus, and, and so we don't know everything about this virus to start with. We're learning more and more about it. So part of it is that the messaging has changed, and that's made it hard for everyone across the state, for those individuals that work with press to try to get a handle on this and understand it. But there has been messaging out there about 
different drugs that are the miracle cure or different things you can put in your water, water bottle that's going to prevent you from getting this or the fact that we have this huge stockpile of PPE here in the state of Indiana that we're holding on onto and not giving or even the concept that there is a large amount of testing available here in states that just isn't being accessed or used. And that makes the messaging all that much more difficult. But I think that the best thing that the governor has helped us with is to make sure that we are transparent and messaging every day the facts as they are, the reality in the state of Indiana. And that's what we continue to have a commitment to. Thank you. Steve, from a Department of Homeland Security perspective. Yes, sir. So my name is Steve Cox. I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Just like Dr. Box uh, mentioned, uh, there's a lot that is just unknown about this particular illness. Um, and so what that does is it, it leaves it open for a lot of folks to be able to spread that misinformation using social media platforms and other places uh, out there. Um, it's it's ever more important right now that you look for a credible source of information. One of the reasons, as I mentioned the other day, that we do these press briefings here is so that we can actually give correct information to the public so that way we can get out so that, that the public knows uh, what we're doing, uh, PPE levels, et cetera, just like Dr. Box mentioned. Uh, there are different medications that are being looked at, vaccine questions, all kinds of things that are out there. Um, we're trying to provide those answers. So just make sure that when you're looking for this information, you're using a credible, uh, a credible source for your information. Steve, uh, yes, sir. could you just elaborate, just give a kind of a thumbnail sketch. We'll go more into this next week. But even on the procurement or acquiring what we're seeing around the world, mm -hmm. um, some misinformation. Sure, uh, so it, even with uh, procurement of some of the supplies of PPE that are out there, there are multiple different types of masks. It's been very, uh, 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 Dr. Box and her staff have been up front with the types of masks that, that have been effective. Uh, that's the N95 mask. Uh, the, the one issue that always comes up when there's a shortage, then something tries to fill the gap. So there have been a multitude of different types of masks out there that have been put forward. Um, I, I, I would leave it to Dr. Box to probably uh, confirm this, but uh, it's, it's very important that people realize the N95 mask is, is the right mask to be able to use. It's not all of the other types of masks that have been manufactured. There are also counterfeits of those different types of masks being uh, propagated throughout the, the world right now. Um, so there are a lot of things that we're trying to deal with right now to make sure that our, our health care providers, EMS professionals, et cetera, are, are receiving the right equipment and uh, the right things that are uh, out there to be able to protect them while they're doing their duties. Um, Thank you. I would, I would just add, when we're talking about masks, N95 masks are critical for people that are on that front line where there are aerosol producing procedures when you're intubating someone or you're giving some type of ventilation treatment that they need an N95. But the other surgical masks work very well and are great for our other hospital personnel to be wearing when they're not in that procedure where they're generating aerosols. But the important things is that some of the N95s that we've received, obviously we've had the good fortune that one of our hospital systems was willing to test them. And of the four that we've sent over, none of them met criteria for being an N95. Now, some that we've been donated lately are amazingly great N95 mm -hmm. masks, and so we'll be sharing those and are sharing those already. Right, and, and we're also trying to work. We're also trying to work with other uh, Indiana companies right now to be able to build out appropriate PPE that we know is credible and meets all of the standards that our uh, healthcare workers and first responders need too. So. And we'll have some good updates on procurement levels next week. Kathy Tretter, Ferdinand News. Hello, Kathy. Good afternoon. Hello. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you. Trust you are as well. Uh, yes, I am. And I'm going to give a shout out to you first for the Community Crossing Grants in my area. I know they are greatly appreciated. Um, understand that Right now, roads aren't necessarily your priority, but they are important, so I did want to give you a shout out. Well, thank you, Kathy. I, I think my questions are for Dr. Box. Okay. Um, and I kind of have three, three things. 
Uh, Dr. Kaufman yesterday said that less than 1% of public safety personnel have tested positive. Does that statistic include doctors and nurses in the hospital, or are we keeping track of the number of physicians and nurses who have contracted COVID-19? So the good Dr. Kaufman is at the podium. Well, I'll let him answer that question for you, please. Yeah, thank you for that question. Mike Kaufman, State EMS Medical Director with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, we are tracking the number of EMS professionals that have either been quarantined or have tested positive. And the numbers that I presented yesterday were those that re were or have been reported through our state web EOC tracking software. Um, it does not include other healthcare professions such as doctors or nurses. Kathy, did you have a follow-up? Well, I, I had a follow-up or a little bit of a different question. Okay. I was curious how many Hoosiers on a given day, on an average day, die. I, I'm sort of trying to put everything into a perspective, and I wondered if you had that statistic. I do not, off the top of my head, I'm sorry, but I can get it for you, Kathy, so if you just reach out, we'll get the number and give it to you. I'm sorry, I don't know that. You wanna talk about, Ka Kathy, go ahead with your uh, third question, and then I'm gonna come back to Dr. Box when you're done. Well, it was gonna probably follow up to that number of deaths, so go, go ahead with yours. Sure, uh, Dr. Box, you wanna talk a little bit about how we typically, how this is unprecedented in reporting on any virus or any um, type of death on a 24-hour period. Right. That's a really good point, Governor. I was sharing with the team earlier that never in the history of the state's epidemiology team have we ever reported every 24 hours and, and updated even in our agency, sometimes twice a day, numbers of positive reports of cases and numbers of deaths on a particular case. Even for our influenza, that reporting is done on a weekly basis. So it gives the team time if somebody has inaccurately been reported as a death in a particular county, like say Marion County, but they really lived in a neighboring county, we can make that correction. So you guys are seeing real time the readjustment and fluctuation of numbers because we are reporting it so quickly. It also gives us time to make sure that all those deaths and all those positives have been reported to us, whereas there is a lag time in these being reported and you also see that in our numbers changing on a daily basis. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Abdul Hakeem Shabazz, Indy Politics. Good afternoon, Abdul. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, question, I guess we can either go to you or uh, Commissioner Cox, Homeland Security. Uh, with the uh, things we've seen down in uh, Johnson County and Mooresville uh, with the recent tornadoes and also uh. the state having to simultaneously deal uh, with COVID-19, uh, any worry or concern that our Homeland Security emergency response to resources might be uh, taxed? Uh, because it is also the springtime. This is uh, yep. in Indiana where we get floods and also tornadoes. Yep, you want to take that, Steve? Oh, I'm happy to. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so in spite of the, the COVID-19 response, uh, we have members of the, the Homeland Security team that uh, typically handle things like damage assessments and that. Uh, and those folks were on the scene uh, early this morning after the, you know, the, the tornadoes uh, went through multiple different counties uh, in the state of Indiana. And so, uh, frankly, they're out there still doing those damage assessments. As you mentioned, in Mooresville, there was some significant damage there. That may take a little bit of time to, to sort out. We also had some damage down in Vincennes and uh, over in Johnson County as well. So our team is out there. They're fully uh, aware of where all the uh, all these incidents took place. And as it stands right now, our team is, is okay with uh, being able to handle the response. Yeah, I would say, Abdul, I was getting from, from uh, Director Cox and his shop reports last night and this morning on Knox County, Boone County, Morgan County, Johnson County. Um, so our personnel was fanned out and continuing to, to uh, cover the state. Mm -hmm. Kayla Sullivan, Fox 59. Good afternoon, Kayla. Hi, I'm here. Sorry, my unmute button came up a little later than expected <laughs> this time. So Dr. Box, I know that you have kind of talked about this lag in testing, but we have observed a decline in testing four days in a row this week. Why is that? And what is the number of tests that the state wants performed each day? And do we think we'll ever meet or exceed the 3,500 tests in one day again? And if so, when do you think that might happen? 
I think that's a really good question. We, we have a, what we call a red cap form that our providers fill out with regards to when they want to test an individual, when they think they're seeing somebody who's significantly ill enough that looks like they have COVID-19. And we really are in the process probably Monday of having that go away altogether uh, because we aren't seeing the maximum number of tests we can do a day actually being sent to us. Part of that is why we are um, having enough swabs and having enough viral transport media going out and trying to do testing for different uh, communities that we know have a higher risk that, that appear to have more cases and make sure we can help them to identify how many people there are sick so that more isolation can occur. Um, sometimes it's a lag in reporting, like I think today the, the numbers are definitely down because of that and it will pick up again tomorrow. But, but we do feel the need to have our providers testing everybody that they think, whether they're gonna admit them to the hospital or not, if they think they're in the high risk category and they've got COVID-19, we want them to test. And we just, I, I've said, let's go forward and test everybody we can. If we are running out of swabs and viral transport media, then we'll turn over another stone and find more. Angelica Robinson, Wayne 15 News. Hello. Good afternoon, Angelica. Hi there, can you guys hear me? We can, crystal clear. <laughs> Thank you. So my question is for Dr. Box. Um, we've learned that Life Care Nursing Home Facility in Fort Wayne has at least six confirmed positive um, COVID-19 cases. Um, I'd like to know if the strike team has been in Allen County at this facility or others, what measures are being taken at this point and what should be taken in general to prevent this, from, this virus from entering the nursing home. So I don't have the list of all the nursing homes that we've been in. I, to my memory, believe that they have been there and that's something that they, they've already been investigating that. But in general, as Dr. Dan said yesterday, and Dan, if you pull, pull those numbers up and you see it and wanna join in, feel free to come to the podium. But realistically, we would have gone out if somebody had been listed as being symptomatic, we would have tested any individual that was symptomatic and also any workers that were there that was symptomatic. And then based on those results, if they're positives, gone back and done additional testing. And at the same time, we would have brushed up um, you know, and looked at exactly what their infection control policies were, exactly how they're managing their patients, how they're using their PPE, and have made any recommendations of anything that need to be changed. For the most part, what we're finding is that our long-term care facilities are following this, but we, we definitely see multiple individuals that work within these facilities that are coming back positive just because they go home to their families. They go to the grocery store, they go to the pharmacy, they can pick it up and be basically very asymptomatic or have minimal symptoms and not realize it and come into the nursing home. And Dan, yeah, Dan's gonna add something. I saw him over there looking at his phone, so. <laughs> Dan Rusiniak, uh, Chief Medical Officer for the Family Social Service Administration. So just looking through our week, yes, the strike team has been out to that facility, life care facility. We were out there on uh, Monday, uh, April 6th, and we tested, I think we tested, it looks like five uh, folks at the facility. Tyler Fenwick, Indianapolis Recorder. Hello, Tyler. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Thank you. My question is for Dr. Box. Um, given what we know about health disparities, especially for African Americans, why hasn't the health department been collecting and reporting that data from the beginning? And do you expect that we'll have it tomorrow? Yes, I do believe that we'll have it tomorrow and we'll be able to show you that. It's not that we haven't been collecting it. When you order a lab on an individual, their name, their date of birth, and their um, race and ethnicity is supposed to be on there. But there's an out that the people that are collecting the lab or sending the lab can check unknown. And so we find that about 40 to 50% of the time they just check unknown, which is probably the easiest thing for them to do, but leaves us in a you know, pickle trying to then go through our vital records data, birth uh, data, and other things to try to match those individuals. So that's what we've been in the process of doing. I think that I'll be very surprised if we don't have the same types of disparities that we're seeing in Illinois and Ohio. And when I talk to my counterparts there, they're presenting data that's missing about 40% of their data. Lindsay Erdoti, the Indianapolis Business Journal. Good afternoon, Lindsay. Good afternoon, Governor. I was wondering if you guys could give an update on the enforcement of a stay at home order on businesses in particular. I know one of the earlier orders allowed the ATC to revoke licenses of restaurants if 
you know, found in violation if necessary. And the new order you signed this week created that response team to enforce it. So I'm just curious to get an update on all of that. Sure. Yeah, if Cindy, you want to come up and maybe talk about the 214 um, complaints that were sent in and the 80 that were followed up with citations and anything else? Absolutely. Uh, Cindy Carrasco, Deputy General Counsel for the Governor. Um, as you indicated, there has been an enforcement team. What I can report to you is that we've met um, these last two days. They are receiving complaints on a daily basis, and they are looking at uh, their teams around the, the state, sending folks out to different businesses to um, give warnings. And as we've mentioned before, it's a tiered step approach. First, it's a warning hey, you're not an essential business, you really should uh, shut your doors. And then the next, if uh, there is some sort of uh, disparity, the next step is to uh, go back with the cease and desist uh, order. We should be having numbers uh, more frequently for you as the days go by, but as the team just started, uh, I can tell you it started and we'll provide updates regularly. Thank you, Cindy and Lindsay. Michael WBEZ. Good afternoon, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. This is uh, Michael Fuente with WBEZ. We're, we're based in Chicago, but we've had a long-standing bureau in Northwest Indiana for 12 years running. Appreciate so you. My is, is for Dr. Box. You were talking earlier about the data that is available, and we're reporting 42 new deaths, but the chart shows three new deaths from Wednesday to Thursday. Am I reading the uh, metric? by day chart correctly. And my second question is, you know, why has there been five times the testing for COVID-19 in Marion County than Lake County? This is the second most populous area of the state. That's a huge difference. Um, that's a really good question. First of all, I, I don't have the the day by day count of numbers in front of me, so I can't answer that right now. I'm, I'm sorry that I can't. With regards to the five times the numbers in Marion County, I will say that Marion County has had a tremendous number of cases, as you know, plus we've had the Marion County Health Department doing drive-through testing here now for over an, a week now doing testing, and Lilly has been doing drive-through testing for our healthcare professionals, um, for our first responders, and for our essential personnel. And that's why we felt the need to start getting out to some other areas in the state, like Lake County, and then down in Southern Indiana, uh, starting next week, so that we could start to help them get that testing. We did do that testing up in Lake County in collaboration with the local health department there. Kevin Rader, WTHR. Good afternoon, Kevin. Good afternoon, Governor. I have, if I can, three very quick. I think Dr. Box, you've addressed some of these already in, in a sense, but on the preliminary numbers based on race, are we seeing any trend there as far as uh, deaths? We, I, and I can't speak to it directly because I don't have that number in front of me, but I know that there are going to be disparities that show up just like every other state has had with African-American individuals suffering more from that. And the number of new deaths has declined for three days in a row. Was it too early for a trend, Dr. Bob? Yeah, I'm not that optimistic. Thank you, though. <laughs> and last question, swabs. Do you have enough of them? Never. Jody Kaufman, WRBI. Hello, Jody. Hello, Governor and Commissioners. Thank you for speaking with me today. I have two questions. My first question, with Decatur County being the highest per capita county since March 31st for positive results and residents being told that they won't be tested when they report symptoms of shortness of breath. What is the state doing to help our county and stop the spread? My second question is a nursing home in Decatur County has seen at least 10 reported deaths since March 28th with only one of those people actually being tested, which was the first death. Even after Wednesday's requirements of reporting, how can a truly accurate death count be made? I'm sorry, I can't speak to the Decatur County um, long-term care facility because I'm, it, it's not one that has been on my radar. So that is something we'll definitely look into. I know that Dr. Dan's looking at that right now on his phone, but I don't think he's seeing anything at this moment. Um, with regards to what are we doing for Decatur County, that's where we're headed down kind of into that south, south um, eastern area to do some more testing down there. But we have definitely engaged with hospital systems over there and 
and have been working with them to increase testing. We have actually couriered tests from over there when hospital systems have needed to test individuals. Um, so I'm happy to engage in another way if, there's, if there are ways that we can help, for sure. Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Good afternoon, Brandon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, this is for Commissioner Payne. Uh, it's a couple of kind of technical questions, but on the system set up for self-employed and independent contractors, right now, what are the biggest obstacles to setting that system up? And two, um, for those who have already applied and like you talked about been denied, once you have the system set up for those folks in place, will they have to reapply or will their information be sort of ported over to this new system? So thanks, those are good questions. The biggest issue that, that we have is that for current employees, employers really report on a quarterly basis uh, income. They report wages, rather. For an independent contractor, for those who are self-employed, our system doesn't have any earnings data for them. So we're going to have to partner with different agencies that have tax records. So our system isn't designed to collect that information. So when a person applies in our system right now, it doesn't recognize them because we have no wage or earnings data for them, not in our unemployment system. And the, the, next, the second part of your question was, uh, could you repeat that, please? The denied. The denied, okay, for the denied. Yes, yeah, so when an individual uh, applies now, they will be denied. And what we're trying to do with our new system is to ensure that they have to provide, we're trying to make sure that they don't have to provide duplicative information. We know that there's going to be new information that they'll have to provide um, in terms of earnings because we don't have that data now. So we're trying to make sure that there's no duplicative information that they have so that they don't have to completely uh, reapply. Alexandra, the Gary Post Tribune. Good afternoon, Alexandra. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I believe this one will be for you. Um, so there has been a call to push for information campaigns to inform Indiana voters about applying to request for an absentee by mail um, application. And so would you encourage voters to vote by mail during the pandemic? And would you go so far as to support a complete vote by mail structure for the June primary? Yeah, I'm, I'm in constant contact with the Secretary of State, Connie Lawson, and uh, through her, and she is in constant contact with both of the party, uh, state party, major state party chairman. This has come up, obviously, and in discussions with the State Election Commission, and they'll have some recommendations. Uh, it would be a good thing for us to, to invite the Secretary of State here when they further those discussions, but right now I'm, I'm um, waiting for them to make a specific recommendation on how we can safely and securely uh, carry out not just our June 2nd, but our November election. Caitlin Lang, the Indianapolis Star. Hello, Caitlin. Hello, Governor. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Awesome. So two questions for you. The first one for you, Governor Holcomb. Okay. Yesterday, a group of indie nonprofits announced $2.6 million to support e-learning in Marion County schools. They're doing things like buying laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, fund professional development, that sort of thing, so that schools can fulfill the mandate put on them by the state. Should the state be stepping up to spend some of its surplus or stimulus money on those efforts. The second question for Dr. Box, most likely, could earlier widespread testing at nursing homes have prevented some of the devastation we're seeing? And if so, why wasn't it made available? Other states seem to be testing at a higher rate, and the mayor of Carmel has said that private labs there, at least, have the ability to test all facilities in the city, and has strongly encouraged all facilities to test all their employees. You want to go first and then I'll follow sure, up so sure. you remember the... So, yeah, right, so I don't forget, <laughs> Governor. Um, first of all, we have not spared any testing with regards to any congregate living setting. That's why we set the strike teams up immediately. That is why we have made the testing available. We've actually gone to them personally so that there wasn't that barrier of taking an individual from a long-term care facility to the hospital where they might actually get infected with COVID-19 if they don't have it. So that testing has been available and been prioritized from the very beginning of our testing. 
With regards to what's going on in, in Carmel, I think that you know we've had some issues with getting reports uh, from that particular lab. We are starting to get some of those now, but I know that they have issues where they've sent it to a lab out of state, and then that state ran out of reagents, so that was sent to another lab, and then that lab has had some issues. So we can say that we have that ability to do it, but what I'm getting complaints of is that people who have been tested never got their results. So I'm not saying that it's a perfect situation or an imperfect situation, but I can tell you we have prioritized the long-term care facilities, our prisons, and our jails from the very beginning. Chris, the uh, budget director, OMB. Hello, Chris Johnston, uh, director, Office of Management and Budget. Uh, Caitlin, I believe your question was regarding using uh, state funds for uh, e-learning opportunities at our K through 12 institutions around the state. And one of the things that you'll be hearing about more uh, tomorrow is uh, the various uh, federal assistance that will be coming out. And part of that is the economic, or excuse me, the education stabilization fund, which does uh, look at and it directs both the governor's office and the Department of Education to look at those schools that are most directly impacted by the coronavirus and looking at what uh, funds could be done uh, to improve those e-learning opportunities. And I would just say, Caitlin, um, you know, it's, this has always been a partnership with um, local and state funding resources, federal as well. And, and I want to say thank you to all of the not-for-profits uh, who are stepping up to fill this void as well. We, the state's been long committed to making sure that we didn't have these digital divides around the state of Indiana, whether it be in um, much of rural Indiana uh, which we are contributing tens of millions of dollars. That's ongoing, just like we announced the Community Crossings program yesterday was moving on. We're still making connections, so e-learning, telemedicine, um, these type of um, connections can occur in rural Indiana, but it also, this is just a reminder here in, in uh, a more urban and suburban setting that those uh, connections have to have to be able to occur for a time like this. and so. Again, I'm passing out some praise, piling on praise to our federal partners who have recognized this, how uh, atypical of a time we find ourselves in, and you're, and you're seeing Hoosiers step up to the tune of 2.6 million in this case uh, to fill that void, and we're appreciative of that. And that's happening all over the state of Indiana. Marcus Green, WDRB Louisville. Sure, hello Marcus, good afternoon. Marcus, you have to unmute your own microphone. Sorry, my computer froze. Thank you. Uh, Governor, I have a question for Dr. Box. Dr. Box, I believe you said that the Clark County drive through testing is now scheduled to open next week. Can you elaborate on why the delay? I believe it was supposed to start this week and is next week a solid uh, estimated start time for that? Yes, according to my team, that's a solid time starting next Wednesday, but I don't have the specific hours, but I think it's Wednesday through Sunday. And in Lake County, they've been doing maybe 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., but I, I've, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Dan Klein, Wish TV. Hello, Dan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, thanks so much for taking my questions. You kind of breezed over a couple of numbers related to the enforcement. Um, something like 200 something and maybe 80 something warnings. Can you be a little bit more specific on that, number one? And then number two, are you prepared to have police break up church services which are not following your guidelines either inside a building or in a parking lot or field or other? Gosh, uh, I, gosh, I, on the second part, Cindy's coming up on the, you're right, it was 214 and um, looked into, of the 214 that were sent in, all 214 were looked into, 80, uh, warnings were delivered. Cindy, you can elaborate on that. But I, I and the second question you have, I hope not. I mean, th this is about worship, and we can we can follow the rules. Um, and I expect uh, folks who are coming to um, receive the word will do just that. Yes, and so uh, to follow up, 214 complaints were looked at. Um, 134 of those were deemed essential. As I said before, this is, we're just getting started. We're going out and giving warnings to folks. We're finding good compliance from people. People wanna follow the rules. Uh, ultimately, we'll continue to provide updates should 
there needs to be uh, more progress on uh, enforcement actions taken by the enforcement team. Thank you, Cindy. Our final question is from Whitney Downard, CNHI. Sure. Good afternoon, Whitney. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to talk specifically about support for rural hospitals. A lot of those depend on those elective procedures, and yet they're spending more than typically budgeted on PPE. Yep. What are some of the ways that we can support our rural hospitals so that way they can continue functioning when a lot of them don't have the reserves or the capital to get through this? Great question. So uh, we have tried to work with our rural hospitals through the Indiana Hospital Association. We know that several of them are critical access hospitals and um, they have been very, they've been working very closely with a lot of their long-term care facilities also because individuals from those facilities who become ill can, can take beds in those critical access hospitals and that's a very good way for them to be cared for going forward. I know just in talking uh, earlier with um, one of the hospitals in Vigo County that they were talking about the ability to be able to get um, through Medicare um, some advances and loans to be able to continue to meet their budgets uh, in, this, in this critical time. I do know that it's been very difficult for them because a lot of them exist on uh, being able to do procedures, whether that's their surgery centers or uh, their cardiac labs, or it may be actually their colonoscopy and other procedures that need to be done. So it's a very real issue out there. I know the federal government has done some things to address it, and we are certainly working with them with regards to how can we help them get more testing, can we pick up their tests for them and, and test it more quickly for them, and on a regular basis, touching base to make sure that if they need other services like PPE or other things that we supply them. And, and honestly, it's been more of those individualized hospitals that have needed more support from the PPE standpoint or even the testing standpoint. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb's next briefing will be tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. Eastern.